This Sunday at 7.15 on ITV, Dr. Weatherby is convinced he's dying in house calls. Seamus, must listen. I'm telling you the truth. You have a mild case of the flu. That's all. That's like saying Elmo Frickin had a mild case of ingrown toenails. Yes, you've all got to keep very quiet, because Peckler has gone home, but he may come back. He's not invited to the funeral. Would you stop with this funeral stuff, and What's the status of this room? Oh, I've blocked it off. Listen, Bradley, if anyone asks, this room is occupied by a patient named Crank. Ezra Crank. He's a typhoid case. At 7.45, while Jonathan Hart plays jazz, a murder plot is being hatched. Who does she think she is? I'll kill her. I swear I'll kill her! You're not gonna kill anybody. Give me the glass. I'm afraid there's been a terrible accident. What's happened? An exciting episode of Heart to Heart at 7.45 with house calls earlier at 7.15 this Sunday night on ITV. Next tonight on London Weekend Television, we join ITN for a specially extended news. From the 26th of April, TWA flies to New York not only from Heathrow, but from Gatwick too. A new service. The first TWA Gatwick to New York service, starting with a special low fare. New York for just £279 return. You can't buy a lower bookable fare to New York. Only £279 return for flights out until the 15th of June. TWA special low fare. Look around. You won't find a better service or a lower bookable fare to New York. £279 return from Gatwick. No wonder we say. Television has come a long way since I invented it. Take this rediffusion TVRM, television receiver monitor. The technology is out of this world. It's specially designed for this new uh, video thing. I can watch Charlie's Angels while recording the Saints match or watch my favorite film. You can even get this teletext thing we jig. Rent any one of 54 combinations of a TVRM with video from Rediffusion and you'll save a bob or two. How inventive. Oh, Terry, I'm so glad you're not like all the others. I'm not. They're just football as your father and off my Lager. Yeah. Sonia. Terry! We're on our way to Wembley. The lads are on the telly. Hello, Sonia. Hello, Sonia. Sorry about that, Terry. We watch the match at Aries. Come on, you read. Come on, you read. Hofmeister. Great lager. Shame about poor Sonia. Shame about poor Sonia. Welcome to Japan. Warriors, right? I'm dead meat. Oh, hey. Trapped. There's no escape. He has to meet the challenge. In the West End now and all over London from Sunday. This is Polaroid's new Sun camera, a new system with the fastest color print film made, 600 speed. But it needs one more thing to turn bad light into good pictures. What's that? A piece of the sun. Daddy long leg. There. A piece of the sun does it. Turn this bad light into a good picture. Sure. You use this on every shot. You see, you've never been so sure of an instant picture. Love it. Now you just reach up. Well, don't waste it. See what a difference it makes. Cadbury's double deckers have grown bigger. Much bigger. On the back. Oh, I'll be fine now. Well, as you should see a doctor. 
The soup you know about blackouts and that. Just you try and make me. I've had about enough of your temper and tantrums. We all have. I went to see the crack. The rings I need a holiday. Don't we all? I know. I'm sorry. I know I've given you a bad time. You asked about us. You know how that side of it was. I couldn't remember the last time we... A change in time tonight at 10.25 on ITV. Tonight at around 20 minutes to midnight, later than advertised in TV Times, John Biner hosts another half hour of the comedy show where nothing is sacred. That's bizarre at 11.40. Now we join ITN for an extended news at 5 to 10. We'll be joining ITN for the news in just a few moments. The top story tonight. The War Cabinet has been meeting at Downing Street tonight to hear the latest suggestions on the Falklands crisis brought back from Washington by the Foreign Secretary. The meeting has just broken up. It's still not clear what the suggestions are, but it's said they contain nothing new that could bring a settlement, and the mood in Downing Street is gloomy. British sources in Washington call the suggestions unsatisfactory. It seems there's been no progress on the crucial questions of sovereignty or the withdrawal of Argentine troops. In Buenos Aires, President Galtieri has said the chances of a peaceful settlement are slipping away. Our political correspondent, David Rose, reports. Mr. Pym arrived back in London at 9.30 this morning after two days of talks in Washington, but with Britain and the Argentine apparently as far apart as ever. The Foreign Secretary brought with him a new set of suggestions from the Americans, which attempt to bridge the massive gap. Mr. Pym took them straight to number 10, where he had a two-hour meeting with Mrs. Thatcher. Uh, yes, I've been uh, reporting to the Prime Minister the discussions I had with Mr. Haig in Washington during the last two days. Uh, we discussed very thoroughly the ideas which he had produced and we also discussed the British ideas which I took over. Early this evening, the War Cabinet assembled again. Present for the first time, Sir Michael Havers, the Attorney General, to advise on unspecified legal problems. The Tory party chairman, Mr Cecil Parkinson, had warned earlier, we are approaching a decisive phase in the crisis. He reported the party's mood. Mr. John Knott walked across Whitehall from the Ministry of Defence for this evening's meeting, while Mr. Pym came back to Downing Street with the Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Whitelaw, for perhaps the most difficult meeting of the inner cabinet since the crisis started. Our political editor in Washington says Mr. Haig would take extremely badly any outright rejection by Britain of the latest suggestions for reaching a settlement. He's thought to have told Mr. Pym that while negotiations continue, there's less chance of war. The Shadow Foreign Secretary, Mr. Healy, has met Mr. Haig in Washington and called for increased American pressure on Argentina to settle the dispute. Mr. Healy said America should make it clear that at the very least it will ban imports from Argentina if Mr. Haig's peace efforts fail. A naval crewman with the task force, Petty Officer Kevin Casey from Dorset, is missing fear dead after a Sea King helicopter from HMS Hermes crashed into the sea. An intensive search was carried out for his body. Prince Andrew was one of the pilots taking part in that. Petty Officer Casey's wife is in the Wrens. The Ministry of Defence isn't saying anything about reports that part of the task force has landed on South Georgia, where 15 Britons are stranded. They won't comment on claims that two British warships and a troop carrier are only a few miles from the island. Argentine naval sources say the ships have been sent to intimidate but aren't in a position to attack the islands. Two more Royal Navy ships have set sail to join the task force. The survey vessels Hydra and Herald have been converted into floating ambulances to ferry casualties to the main hospital ships. Argentine police have started compiling registers of British residents there, going from door to door in some areas and checking identity cards. One police source described it as a preventive control measure. The Argentine Britons have again been warned by the Foreign Office to get out 
A statement on the BBC World Service talked about a period of increasing tension and risk. Those who've not so far acted upon earlier warnings are asked to consider again whether they should take an early opportunity of leaving the country by normal commercial means. We've two reports from Buenos Aires, one on the reaction of the Britons there, but first on the mood of the Argentines. The possibility of an imminent British attack on the sparsely defended island of South Georgia dominates the front pages here today. Argentine sources claim that five British warships are within 50 nautical miles of the islands, but that heavy storms are hindering their progress. President Galtieri returned here overnight following his review of the troops on the Falklands and later sent a protest note to the Organization of American States to complain that the British ships had penetrated what was called Argentina's naval security zone. This morning at the military high command headquarters in Buenos Aires, the president and other members of the ruling junta met with Foreign Minister Costa Mendes. Mr. Mendes flies to Washington tonight to seek the assistance of Latin American countries in the Falklands dispute under the terms of the 1947 Rio Treaty. With time quickly running out, the big fear here is that a British strike against the South Georgia Island will effectively end the current peace negotiations and mark the beginning of a major military conflict. Norman Rees, ITN in Buenos Aires. At the British Embassy here, only one diplomat remains. He's described as the joint head of the British section of the Swiss Embassy, who now run the building. The latest strong warning urges all Britons to leave the country. I asked our man in Argentina about the mood of those who are still here. I think it's one of concern and anxiety, but I wouldn't put it any more seriously than that. Uh, essentially, they are preparing for the worst, but hoping for the best. In the fashionable suburb of Belgrano, where the athletic club was once a little England, the British members' names are now being added to a national police list of United Kingdom passport holders. It's a harsh reminder that after years of living in harmony, their status could soon change. Most say their Argentine neighbours are urging them not to worry. Some, like Mr Jack Oliver, will ignore the warning to leave the country. I'm not going to leave because I've got nowhere to go. I'm, I'm 70 years old. Are you worried about being here at this time? Oh. Firstly, I don't think they'll intern us because it's going to cost them money. The Falkland Islanders organised a one-day strike last week as their way of celebrating the Queen's birthday. The strike was revealed by a Briton who's just been flown off the island with his family. Mr James Burgess also said many of the islanders now want to leave. He said they're frightened a lot of people will be killed if British troops land and there's a battle there. Jim Burgess and his family have lived in the Falklands for four years. They consider themselves lucky. The Argentines invaded on the morning they were going to buy a house in Port Stanley. They decided to make their home there until their children grew up. Mary Burgess was a nurse in the hospital, her husband a carpenter, but his broadcast for the local radio station made him a well-known figure, who among other things helped to organize the one show of resistance and cause of some mirth this past week, a general strike on Wednesday to celebrate the Queen's birthday. They, the Argentines, heard about it. They got word of this, and first of all, we got told that if we didn't work on Wednesday, we wouldn't be paid for the work we'd done for the rest of the week. And then they changed the tune, and in the evening when I went to the studio to announce, there was a little note there that said, I think I can quote it. Uh, tomorrow being Queen Elizabeth's birthday, uh, there is an optional holiday, and you can go to work if you want to, but if you don't want to go to work, you'll still get paid. Well, as we said earlier, the War Cabinet meeting at Downing Street has just broken up. Our political correspondent, David Rose, is there. Tonight's War Cabinet lasted three hours. It ended just 45 minutes ago, and to the, tonight the mood here at Downing Street is despondent as it's been all day. It's now clear how deep are the divisions on the three main points between the Argentines and the British government. These three central issues are the interim administration after withdrawal, the sovereignty of the islands, and the need to consult the islanders. Nor are the British much happier with the so-called compromise proposals from the Americans. At present, there is little prospect of their being accepted, although the British government are willing to go on talking about them so as not to upset the Americans. And indeed, Mr. Pym has been in touch with Mr. Haig by telegram in the last few minutes, presumably, to pass on decisions taken here tonight. But this war cabinet tonight probably lasted as long as it did for one simple reason. Britain is now, for the first time since this crisis started, 
in a position to use force if negotiations aren't working. And tonight it seems as if negotiations aren't working. Mrs Thatcher's about to leave for Chequers, presumably to mull over in the country the most important decision of her political career. David Rose, ITN, in Downing Street. British Marines sank some sort of landing craft during the invasion of the Falkland Islands, and the bodies of about 25 Argentine soldiers have now floated to the shore. That's according to the editor of the island's newspaper. Mr David Colville, now back in Britain, says he personally saw two bodies in Stanley Harbour. And he said there have been reports that Argentine firing squads are shooting their own troops for discipline offences. The Ministry of Defence say they can't confirm either incident. Apparently four soldiers have been executed. Uh, Islanders have told me that uh, some soldiers stole uh, four eggs from a hen house of hers. She reported it to the military authorities and they marched these unfortunates away and you know they were completely stripped of their hats, weapons, whatever. They were marched away in the company of military police and officers and next thing they were taken up to a rifle range which belongs to the Stanley Rifle Club, which now, of course, the Argentines have taken over. And next thing, a fusillade of shots, similar to a firing squad, and the others, the military police and the officers came down, but no sign of the four men. Police fought with animals' rights protesters tonight after a crowd burst through security fences at the top-secret Porton Down Research Centre. The trouble started when 5,000 demonstrators marched to the laboratories to protest against the number of animals used in experiments. Thunder flashes were thrown at 400 civil and Ministry of Defence police and a group of youths trampled down part of the perimeter fence. The protesters got within 100 feet of laboratory buildings and a number of arrests were made. The sports minister, Neil McFarlane, has said the government would resist any pressure from the World Cup organisers to bar Britain's three teams because of the Falklands crisis. But he's likely to be meeting with the football authorities in England, Scotland and Northern Ireland next month to review the situation. Now, with the more conventional sports news of the day, here's Ian Edwards. Liverpool are now within a whisker of winning their 13th league title. A Ronnie Whelan goal just two minutes from time gave them a 3-2 win at Southampton. And with Ipswich only managing to draw one all at Manchester City, Bob Paisley's side are now four points clear at the top. Only Spurs, who kept up the pressure with a 3-1 win at home to Notts County, seem to have a chance of overtaking them. Things are also looking pretty well settled in the second division. Luton drew two all at Rotherham, but the vital game was at Vicarage Road, where Watford were at home to Sheffield Wednesday. Ivor Geber saw that match. With promotion on both teams' minds, the game got off to a tense and nervous start. But after 18 minutes, a Watford break on the left put Blissett away. He crossed to Callaghan, who made no mistake. It was the start of a 20-minute blitz. Eight minutes later, a mishit clearance by Blackhall in the Wednesday defence gave Taylor the chance to present Barnes with an open goal. 2-0 and more to come. Just three minutes on, from the corner, Jenkins flicked on to Blissett. And Watford with three up. Nine minutes later, and it was the Jenkins-Blissett combination again, this time taking advantage of a mistake by Wednesday centre-back Pickering. 4-0, and that was really that. Wednesday offered some token resistance in the second half, but were never able to capitalise on their chances. Wednesday's manager, Jackie Charlton, said, we had a bad day. Nobody could argue with that. Ivor Gaber, ITN Sport at Watford. In Scotland, Celtic stay nine points clear at the top after a 3-0 win at Partick. Rugby and Cardiff have retained the Welsh Schweppes Cup. They could only manage a 12-all draw with Bridgend, but keep the trophy because they scored the only try. Bridge end in the white shorts couldn't have made a better start when in the second minute Pierce dropped a goal. This was Bridge end's fourth successive appearance in the final and they showed scant respect for Cardiff's supposed superiority when Titley's speed put them under pressure. The almost inevitable infringement by the Cardiff defence was further penalised by Pierce's boot. But the balance was restored just before half-time, with a bulldozing run from Kevin Edwards. With Ian Eidman going over for the try. 
And though that decided the match, Bridgend have good reason to be optimistic about the future, especially when a winger of Titley's calibre can run like this. I suspect it won't be long before he's challenging for international honours. Racing at Sandown Park, there were a lot of punters hoping that Diamond Edge was going to win the Whitbread Gold Cup for a third time. He didn't, but it was one of the most exciting finishes in years. Wide open to the last fence. Graham Good is the commentator. Coming down to the final fence and King's Cruise comes through. King's Cruise comes through to take it up to what we knew. Shady there on the near side, Father Delaney, and not getting a lot of room, but coming well inside the final third on. Shady Deal was first, Ottery News second, and King Spruce third. A young woman made history in senior cricket today. 20 year old Sarah Potter, daughter of Dennis Potter, the playwright, turned out for the Herefords' second 11. It's the first time that a woman has played in men's league cricket in this country, and Sarah's first problem was where to change. While the men had the pavilion, Sarah was confined to the basement. In she went to bat. She was nearly caught off her first strike, but then as her confidence grew, so did the runs. After Sarah had helped the score onto 78, she was caught for 14, but was well pleased with her first innings. Mm, it's nice not to be out for a duck on your, on your debut. <laughs> You think you're going to like men's cricket? Yes, I think so. You know, the, the guys are really great out there as well, which makes it nice. But, I mean, it is, it is competitive when you're playing in a league and going for points and everything. But um, once I got over the first couple of overs, yeah, I enjoyed it. Coming next in Falklands Extra, America's Dilemma. Why President Reagan won't come out clearly on the side of Britain. That's in a couple of minutes. Join us again. <laughs> You really cut corners when you decorate a cake with home prides, new top and fill, no mixing, no messing. In chocolate, vanilla, coffee and lemon flavours, enough to top and fill one of these sponges or lots of these. Lovely. Home prides, new top and fill. It's simply delicious. Once a week, every week of the year, Texaco open a newly modernized petrol station. Annual investment, millions of pounds. Benefits, cleaner, faster, more efficient service. When it comes to working harder for Britain's motorists, Texaco, the driving force. We never forget you have a choice. From May 21st, British Caledonian flies non-stop to Los Angeles with economy class, exclusive executive cabin, and first class with we sky lounger seats. You have a choice. Our separate terminal at Los Angeles will mean easier onward connections and less inconvenience at customs. Did I see you in Oklahoma? No, Richard III, actually. From May 21st, British Caledonian, a better way to fly to L.A. People jumped up suddenly. We never forget you have a choice. We never forget you have a choice. British Caledonia. This Sunday sees the second most eagerly awaited royal event of the year. The first episode of Princess appears in the Sunday Express magazine. Princess is Robert Lace's definitive study of the Princess of Wales. And no one will want to miss a word. While in the paper, there's the very latest Frederick Forsyth. The man who wrote The Day of the Jackal brings you no comebacks, each Sunday for five weeks. A strikingly different short story. The Sunday Express. It adds so much to Sunday. You got enough bottle to get through tomorrow? Put a note out tonight. Buy a brawn shaver now and you can get a big refund on male and lady shavers. How's that for a shave and how's that for a price?
With the Foreign Secretary, Mr. Pym, now back in London, the crucial talking continues in Washington. Argentina's Foreign Minister, Senor Costa Mendes, is due to arrive there tomorrow. Costa Mendes is scheduled to meet Mr. Haig, but his primary job will be to seek a vote at a special Washington meeting of the Organization of American States on Monday, which could seriously embarrass the United States. Argentina's invasion of the Falkland Islands on April 2nd put the United States in a difficult position. Committed to stemming what it sees as a rising tide of Marxist insurgency in Latin America, 